Hello, and welcome to Tabletop Bellhop Live, episode 30, Finding Your Yoda, a game career you, guru you quest for. <laughs> from Hamilton, Ontario, I'm Sean, and here with me, live and direct from Windsor, Ontario, the Tabletop Bellhop himself, Moti. I am the Tabletop Bellhop, your cardboard concierge, answering your gaming and game night questions and striving to make everyone's gaming experience better. Let me put my years of gameplay, event organizing, and game night hosting to use for you. I'd like to say hi to everyone in the lobby here on Twitch. We start here live every Wednesday night at 9.30 Eastern on Twitch TV slash Tabletop Bellhop and continue on even after the double bell ends the show for more off the books after show. We love hearing from our listeners and viewers. Each week we hope to highlight some of that feedback, both positive or negative. We get better with your comments and suggestions. If you'd like to let us know something about the show, send your feedback to mo at tabletopbellhop.com and or sean at tabletopbellhop.com. That's S-E-A-N. Uh, you can also hit us up on social media where I can be found everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. I can be found as Dark Elf LX. Uh, first up, we've got Karlik Kendrick, who left a comment on one of our Gloomhaven actual play videos. I have it on good authority he may just be a Marvel hero. I wait for this game to come out on Steam. I can't put out money for the box, but the online game will be a ton of fun. Well, thanks, Kendrick. And you're in luck. There is already an approved Isaac-approved uh, mod for Tabletop Simulator on Steam. Now, Ivan Sorensen commented on our Bad Rules No Problem article over on TabletopBellhop.com. Wonderful answer. Being able to read game rules with a critical eye towards comprehension is a skill, and it is not the same as being an editor. Uh, thanks, Ivan. Totally agree. Both of us, both Sean and I agree with this. Uh, when we discussed this topic last week on our podcast, uh, Sean brought up the differences that a technical editor and a technical writer are not the same thing. And neither of those are the same as a fiction editor. You want the right kind of editor. And game rules are technical writing, whether we want to admit it or not. Now, the final comment I want to highlight this week is a longer one from Phil Hatfield, which goes back to our Teaching New Gamers versus Experienced Gamers article. Now, I thought he made an excellent point here about using theme. The trick I do when explaining games to new to gaming players is to describe things in a manner that incorporates the inherent theme, if any, in the game. The relation of a mechanic and a thematic aspect of the game tends to reinforce why the player needs to do it. I'll use Agricola as an example, as there are lots of aspects to teach new people, and I recently did it. In the game, players need to allocate a worker to a location in order to take an action. Actions can do a lot of different things, but one of the primary actions is to gain food that will be required in the harvest phase at a two food per worker ratio. But explaining that way may be a bit dry and cause confusion to absolutely new people. So I show them the food tokens. I just call it food. I show them their workers, but I call them Ma and Pa. Ma and Pa go out to work on their farm, plowing fields and gathering grain or herding animals. Now you might have a plowed field and you might have grain. But in order to get more grain, you need to plant that grain and let it grow. And in order to gain benefit from the sheep you herded, which you need to keep in a fenced pasture, otherwise the sheep run away, is to have some way to cook the sheep up. You can't eat it raw. So you need to build a fireplace or an oven. Then you can cook your sheep for food. Or you can turn some of that grain into bread. Sure, you can eat the grain without cooking it, but it takes a lot of it to feed a person. When you make bread, you can feed more people with just a little grain. Now that really helps people envision and understand why they need to do things and why they need to take certain steps before they take other steps. You need to gather wood to build a fence and to make a pasture before you can herd animals into your pasture. You herd animals first and those animals will run away, except the one you can keep in your house. It's logical, it makes sense, and it fits the theme of the game, which reinforces the understanding of the game in a more logical manner than referring to action phases, or sorry, action spaces and harvest phases and major improvement cards and so on. Well, thanks, Phil. That's uh, some great detail in there and a fantastic way to teach these games, uh, especially to the really non-gamers who just don't uh, don't have that concept of spaces and phases the way mm -hmm. someone who's got a little bit more XP in gaming does. The biggest thing I see about this is a great example of theme tying to mechanics in Agricola. 
Absolutely. Not every game has that. And when a game does, it, it does make perfect sense to use that while teaching the game. And now, Tabletop Gaming Weekly, where we look back and summarize what's happened since we were last year. What games <laughs> hit our tabletops? Every week, we like to take a look back at the games we played, any events we've attended, and other cool gaming stuff that's going on. You can catch the blog version of This Week in Review at TabletopBellhop.com under On the Table. Lots of games for me this last week. Uh, I had uh, Azul, Stained Glass of Sintra, four different kids' games uh, with the kids with multiple plays of each game, and then an epic game of Zaya Legends of a Drift system with all the expansions. And, of course, our regular Gloomhaven game, which we finally got all four of us back to the table. While I got in my now usual assortment of cards with DC, Harry Potter, and a lot more Ascension, and I even squeezed in a game of Battleship. Hey, there's a classic. Now, I'm very happy to say that we finally got the full group, the full four of us back together again and got to continue our Gloomhaven campaign. It's been, I think, three weeks. It might have been even longer. I know it's been at least three weeks. Now, I've been enjoying the random dungeons we've been playing with two and three players, but it's definitely way more fun when we've got the full group together and we're actually advancing the plot line, unlocking new things and playing the game as it's meant to be played. Now, if you remember a few weeks back, uh, the last thing we did was we went to the Elemental Plane, where we met some big, bad, bad guy demon who was like, well, I'm going to kill you if you don't get an artifact. And we're like, yeah, sure, no problem. We'll go get you an artifact. And we left and went to Gloomhaven, leveled up, bought some equipment. Then we came back and we kicked that demon's butt. Now, this past week, we decided to go get that artifact. Because, well, there's no demon to worry about anymore, so I guess we'll keep it for ourselves. So the actual mission was number 22, Temple of the Elements. I got to say it was a lot of fun. So far, I love any Gloomhaven scenario when it's not just about beat up the bad guys. Beating up the bad guys is fun, but it's much more interesting when there's other stuff to do. Now, this particular scenario had some rather interesting scenario rules that really challenged us at first. By the time we hit room three or the second room off the big hallway, it was not looking good for us. But we did manage to recover and win the day, despite two of our four characters ending up exhausted by the end. Now, you say it wasn't looking good and, and, and you were concerned, but I have to say from the stream side of things as a viewer, uh, you guys certainly look pretty confident. And uh, especially knowing that uh, the level you were at, it it looked good. I... It was that first couple hits from those cursed couple demons when they were all boosted up and basically Tori lost half his hand in one hit. That that was a little scary. We were a little worried for a bit there. And the fact we did two, lose two characters, I can't say it was easy. No. But we did, I think we played well. Uh, we did play on, this was actually, I didn't even note this before. Uh, we played on normal difficulty. This was the first time since like scenario three that we decided to try on the appropriate normal difficulty level. And, and we did it. We did it well. Uh, there is one thing I want to note, though. This was an interesting find. So as we play Gloomhaven, it's been an interesting journey on the fact that I keep discovering new things about the game that I didn't quite realize were going to be in there. Right? The first being that you can have multiple parties. Another thing was the whole playing casual versus playing uh, campaign play. Well, this scenario we basically backtracked the main plot, right? Like we had gotten to the big demon, the demon said, do this or this, and we did this. And then we kind of went, is there any reason we can't do this too? And at first I wasn't even sure. So I actually like double checked the rules and didn't see anything that said, you can't do that. Then I even Googled it just to be sure we weren't messing anything up. So if you finish mission 21, can you do mission 22? Um, now the game does take care of this normally because there's like the global achievement and the party achievements. And none of those seem to be impacting it. But I couldn't find any reason not to, so we did it. Now, what's interesting is when we finished the mission, we got to the conclusion part, and the thing it gave us were two new scenarios and two new locations. But because we completed mission 22 already, we can't play these. We can't go to them. So we basically kind of hit a dead end. And the other thing is no other group that plays my copy. So if we made another party, they still can't do this because there's a global achievement on my board that was unlocked earlier that prevents either of the two, these two missions ever being played with my copy of Gloomhaven. I thought that was interesting to see that actually happen and come up. Like we put the stickers on the map, but no one's ever going to check those off. Yeah. I mean, that's gotta be a little frustrating. It's a lot like if you were reading a, a 
a which way book and you got to a section and someone else had gone in and erased that section yeah. of the book for you because you're not allowed to go there. You, you're not allowed to read that, um, you know, and, and having that unlocked and just sort of yanked away mm -hmm. before it's even uh, before it's even possible. I guess I yeah. mean, that, that's what comes with playing a legacy game. But it's interesting because of the roundabout uh, nature that you're able to take in mm -hmm. this game, uh, you wouldn't necessarily run into a wall like that in most legacy games even. Correct. Yeah, I totally agree. Uh, the other thing, too, that's that I did realize after the fact is technically we could play them in casual mode. Right. Just to try it, right? So we could see if we could beat the mission. Right. So instead of doing a random dungeon, we could go do those missions. So it's not like that part of my box set is useless and will never be used. Right. It's still there. It's still in the scenario book. But casual like I'm thinking. Only. Yeah, casual only. Plus, it might be a good one that if I ever want people who aren't in our main campaign to see the game, I now have a couple scenarios that aren't going to spoil anything for me That's if true. I play them with an outside group. And now remember, you guys can watch the Bellhop, uh, Deanna, and K2R play Gloomhaven every Friday <clears throat> and rewatch them when the episode comes out on YouTube the Thursday after uh, we record. Now, for me, I got in a game of Harry Potter, the uh, Monster Box of Monsters. Uh, now, we talked about this last week. And we very nearly beat it. We played no extreme rules and no cheat. Nice. So I have to say, uh, as much as I do understand where that player was coming from last time, uh, I've now got hope, and I'm and I'm not ready to to make all those changes yet because uh, we came very close, uh, and and we had some tough uh, some tough villain combos against us. So I, I think it really is a doable uh, a doable thing, and and I think I think my kids are going to feel better if if we. Uh, can make it through before without uh, bending the rules. Yeah, very true. Um, do you think at this point it's a player skill thing? Can you learn to beat this, or is it just a luck of the cards? I think there, there's a little bit of both. Uh, again, some of these villain combos. Again, it's a random draw. It's a random villain mm -hmm. deck, uh, and some of those villain combos, uh, I hesitate to say are unbeatable, but make it really tough. Whereas uh, I, we've definitely gotten harder. Um, or we've definitely gotten better players. I've actually switched. Uh, I had been the Neville booster all the way through mm -hmm. that original box. Uh, I'm now uh, I'm now playing Ron, uh, and I feel like it's it's fitting better into the monster box of monsters, and that that may be part of it as well. Would another possibility be to add in a fourth player or at least fourth character, having someone play two? Uh, Does you know that what? make it easier? I'm not sure because that also gives the villains one more chance to do everything. So right. I, I'm I'm not uh, I'm not sure I I almost sat down and played a uh, a solo two handed player version just to see mm -hmm. how that worked out but I just haven't had time to get around to it yet. Yeah, here we haven't we haven't touched the game again. Unfortunately, it's not one that's come out a second time. So we're still on book three of the original box set. Right. So Gloomhaven, uh, like Sean said, we were pretty confident. Not only that, we were playing quickly. We've definitely gotten faster at playing Gloomhaven in general, not just the decision-making, just set up, the way I've got things set up in my basement, how I unpack the game and stuff like that has gotten a little quicker. So we finished in under two hours, which is really good for that game, I find. Uh, so we had some time left on Friday night, so we broke out Azul Stained Glass of Sintra again. Um, we streamed it too. So actually this coming Saturday, you'll be able to watch that on YouTube just cause we put out an actual play. If you want to watch us play Sintra, I don't know what it is with that game and me, but it just, I, it hasn't clicked yet. Like I've now played it three times. That might've been four times, three or four times. I don't even remember now. And it just, I can't seem to wrap my head around this version of Azul. Like there's just more to think about. Like the, the mechanics are simple. I get the physicality of where my things go and that when they go in this column i score points but just the strategy right i've i've yet to find a single strategy that works i'm like i'm gonna try to build on the left side of my board first so that when i score them no nah, that didn't work oh, i'm gonna try to collect all one cut no nah, that didn't seem to work now overall with the groups uh, group of players i've been playing with right because i've been playing with uh tori cat deanna quite often as well as sean hamilton some other locals have all played about three four games each so overall as a group we all seem to be getting better at it like overall our scores are getting higher um we all get like i said the mechanics the rules how to play the game we just haven't seemed to figure out exactly how to play it well though i do have to say sean hamilton may be an uh, idiot savant at this game because oh my god the first time he played that game he destroyed us like utterly destroyed us he he like 
by 40 points or something. It's insane. But he also made a really good point when I was actually complaining about this live while playing that, man, I don't know how you're doing that because I can't get it. He's like, no, I'm sorry. It requires a very different way of thinking than the base game of Azul. And I guess my brain, his brain seems to go there really easily. And mine's like trying to chug up the mountain because I'm not even close. I tend to come in last every game of Sintra. So overall, though, I got to say, it's still fun. It, this isn't ruining it for me, but I got to say, it's still nowhere near to my love of the original as well. I, I'm, I'm starting to think now, the more and more I see this and hear it talked about, that it seems to uh, be a shame that it got called Azul. Uh, if they had just called it the Stained Glass of Sintra uh, by the people who made Azul, uh, I wonder if people would be as, um, I don't want to say critical, but sort of, you know, hard on it because it's not Azul and it's not supposed to be Azul, but because it says it's Azul, everyone compares it immediately to Azul. I, I don't know, because the problem is part of it is Azul. Like, part is identical. The fact you are pulling perfectly square tiles off round markets using the exact same mechanic where you have to take all of one color and all the rest go in the center. And if you don't, if you take first player, you're, you break something. And if you take more tiles than you can use, you break something. That's all identical. Yeah. Now, all or, the rest is different. Yeah. But that, or, to me, is enough to still call it Azul, I would or maybe, think. Or maybe stained glass of... Azul or stained glass of Sintra Azul or something. Yeah, I, I don't that, know. The, the way it's been named, I think, is is over uh, forcing the the comparison when, yes, there are absolutely similarities, yeah. but it really is. I mean, Sean's right, I think. It, it really does take a different thought. It is a different game um, for all its similarities. It plays very differently. Yeah. The actual once you place your tiles is very different. I'm trying to I'm trying to think there's other games that are in the same brand that I think are even further apart but still have something similar. I don't know. The other thing too well, is I mean, it's most popular you enough get into, why would you get into put that on it? Look at Catan when you Well, that's at, a good, uh, there's a good example. Catan Cities and Knights versus yeah. Catan, like even my argument, right? I call one Cities and Knights and I call the other Catan and I think of them as different games. Yeah. Instead of one being an expansion for the other. What they need to do is a Azul big box where you use the same tiles, but you have two different boards and two different ways to play. That would have been the best way to market it. But then, well, no, it wouldn't because then you wouldn't buy two different games. <laughs> and so my next game off the, on my pile was uh, the DC Deck Builder again. Uh, and as well as my son now, my daughter has decided to join in. Now, I actually didn't expect this at all. You know, she likes superheroes, but it's not a real big fan. It's not a theme she has any real attention to. But she saw Evan and I playing and, and decided she was going to jump in. And she took to it like a fish to water. Uh, awesome. she, she kicked our butts the <laughs> first time through. Um, I think I was still focused on how my son plays and making sure I was countering that. That I hadn't even really considered the fact that there was a third player. Uh, and also some of the pass the cards and, and, and um, attack and defend actions that happen in that game um, take on a whole new thing when there's actually that third player and you are passing mm -hmm. to the left you're not just passing back and forth across from another player uh so that was great and then we played it again uh at the end of the week uh and she jumped in or she wanted to jump in but we'd already started a game uh my son ended up going out and playing playing outside with some friends and uh we stole his we basically just packed up we hadn't even hadn't even beaten the first villain yet so we packed that up and restarted it mm -hmm. and uh just she and i played so um, that's gone really well. I'm, I'm really happy with that. Oh, that's awesome. That is awesome. It's also good to hear that there's obviously not just one valid strategy that someone can come in and start doing something completely different and like, oh, wait, I have to adopt, adapt my strategy for their play. That's a, just a sign of a good game to me. Yeah, no, absolutely. Speaking of gaming with the kids, I also had a day of gaming with my kids, which was last Saturday. Uh, both Deanna and my mom were out of the house doing some accounting and some work, and I figured I'd take the chance to play some uh, games with the kids. Now, my kids have their own shelf of games, bookshelf of games, and I got to say it's getting rather full. Actually, it's pretty much overfilled after Christmas. There's games stacked on top of it. And they actually surprisingly have a couple of their own shame games, their own pile of shame games. I probably should have put them on my list because they're probably going to play them with me. But these are games they got as gifts from like aunts and uncles who obviously don't listen to our show or watch my podcast. So uh, you can guess on the kind of quality on those games. But I wanted for one to, to try these out. But I uh, also wanted to try out some other games just to see if the kids were uh, willing to get rid of them because we're out of room. 
Now, my kids haven't got shame games, but I wish they would get rid of some of them. They are so far beyond them, but they still like them as they have fond memories from them about yeah. them as they from playing them uh, younger, and and will still take them out and force themselves to play them <laughs> just out of pure stubbornness because they don't want to get rid of it. Yeah, we've been we've done it pretty much the kids' whole life. They've they've had to purge often, so they're they're used to having to purge whatever toys, stuffed animals, clothes, whatever it happens to be. Especially when they had to move to a smaller room, there was a big purge then, so it's right. it's fairly normal for them. So of course we do get the whole, but I love it. And I'm like, okay, yeah, fine, we'll keep it. So the first game we ended up playing, uh, the first thing I wanted to play. Now this wasn't one of their shame games; it was one of mine. Uh, this is Quirkle Cubes. Uh, this was a gift from little G to me that she gave me for Christmas, uh, but I let them keep it with their games because that's I'm probably going to play it most often with them. Actually, I do this with a lot of the games they enjoy. Like uh, their my copy of Bl uh, Blockus, Quirkle, and Genius is all on their game shelf because they're the games we play as a family. Now, Quirkle Cubes is an awesome evolution of Quirkle. It's basically the same game. If you've played Quirkle before, all you're doing is playing tiles and you're matching shape or color, and you're getting points for the tiles you played, plus any rows you added to. So think Scrabble style scoring. So you have some tiles on the board, you're going to add to the tiles there with some tiles of your own. It's they either match in color or they match in shape. If you complete a full set, and there's six colors and six shapes, so if you play six different colors, or six different shapes, or six of all the same color, or six all the same shapes, you get what's called a quirk hole, and you get six extra points. Otherwise, it's just one point per tile. What's really neat in Quirkle Cubes is that it changes these tiles into dice. And the dice, there's six different colors of dice in the original six colors, and each of the six sides is each of the original six symbols. And the only rule change is before you place your tiles, which are now dice, you can roll them to change them to something else. That's it. It doesn't change anything else. It's Quirkle with dice. I really like this. I actually felt it was a step up from Quirkle. Because in Quirkle, you can often get stuck with a bad hand. And, of course, there's a Scrabble rule in there, I think, where you can just ditch your whole hand to get a new one if you pass. Whatever, that's kind of a lame rule, in my opinion. In this, and, and in that, you often will have to play just one or two tiles because you have no other play, and it's get, like, two points. While playing this, like, we had, I think, twice the entire time. We played three times. We only played two or less tiles. Most of the time, we were playing three or four tiles or connecting two rows. There was a lot more scoring and a lot more interaction. Plus... Because we're playing more tiles and the game ends when the bag's out of tiles, it was quicker because you played more tiles more faster. Right. I really was impressed by this. Like this, this may uh, Jones Theory Quirkle out of my collection because it just seems like a better version. That's interesting, and it's funny how you, how you talk about the lame rule where you have to you know wipe wipe the deck or whatever to yeah. to help out, and and usually that's a uh, a response to overly random. Mm -hmm. potential right when when you've got that random potential that could just kill you because you roll yeah. six sixes or whatever whereas the dice are now countering that random potential yeah. on their own because it, when you add the two randoms together it becomes a, a, enough of a source of entropy that <laughs> that 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 avoids the problem uh in its own method so you yeah. don't need that lame rule anymore yeah i was very happy with it overall just the game and, and i guess like the whole thing we found, too, is when you roll, you tended to keep the one die you're going to place, and you're hoping for extra. Right. So it was always like, I've got to move, and let's see if I can make that move a little better, which was cool. It was very seldom. It was like, I, I think once Big G re-rolled all her dice, but I think that's just lack of experience playing the game. Yep. It was good enough. We played that three times, so that that's a good sign, and that's with um, my littlest who has uh, lacks focus sometimes, we'll okay. say. So it, it was good to see her that into it. So now, up next, we grabbed one of those shame games. Now, this this game has been on their shelf for a while. It's kind of sad they hadn't played it for a while. It's called Professor Noggin's Creatures of Myth and Legends. Now, this is an educational game. And sadly, most educational games are not so great. And that seems to be a, a, a meme, a, a truth in board gaming. A very sad one. I wish more developers and publishers would work to change. And this is a good example of one of those not-so-great educational games. It's a very basic trivia game. You've got cards with mystical creatures. On the back are two sets of questions, easy and hard ones. You roll a D3, excuse me, you roll a D3 and you read off the appropriate question to the player on your right. If they get it right, they keep the card. If not, it goes in the bottom of the pile. 
what I guess is kind of interesting, though it makes the game long, is that the game only ends after every single card in the deck is answered correctly by someone. Now, the rules note this is a good thing, because this is how you learn, because when a card comes around, everyone should pay attention, so you hear the right answer, even if someone gets it wrong, and then when the card comes back up, you'll know the answer if that same question's asked, which I guess is great from an educational point of view. But as a game, it really means, for one, the game's way longer than I think I would like it to be, like you just keep going through the deck, and replayability's limited, right? Because eventually the players are going to learn all the answers, which again, great for education, not so great for a game. Now here's the big problem. There is a totally random, totally pointless take that mechanic. On some cards, the number two question isn't a question, instead says noggin rules with a big exclamation mark. That means the player gets to use noggin's rules and steal a card from another player. What, what's up with that? What does that reward? What is that teaching? I, I don't get it. Yeah, it, I, this could be worse. I actually uh, just, just typed uh, Professor Noggins into BGG. And there yep. are wonderful titles like Professor Noggins' Civil War or <laughs> Professor Noggins' Rainforests of the World, which are fantastically educational topics. But mm -hmm. uh, I can see why they're getting two out of ten on Board Game Geek and, wow. yeah, it's and, a two. and things. Wow. I mean, you know, these are these are getting actually Civil War actually has a seven out of ten somehow. But I, I'm I'm probably uh, not a lot of rain. Oh, with four reviews. So yeah, there it's, you go. <laughs> Um, I don't know. It, it's it, these. It, these it, seem like something that should be in a classroom, that, so that yeah. they the replayability lasts because they're in the classroom, and, and every year yeah. a new set of students come a bit through. This this doesn't really look like a uh, a home game type. No, not not great. But though I don't know. I I'm, I'm assuming it's not an expensive set of cards, and if there was a topic your kids probably are hard, having a hard ta time with, it might be appropriate. Uh, I noted Anshi Games notes they're basically educational flashcards, and yes, they threw on a a bit of a game to it, but the game part just is not good. Yeah, I, I there is the the Ancient Civilizations one is like fourteen bucks. Yeah, so they're cheap enough, and I guess like like once you're done, the kids have learned all this stuff, so you can go buy the next set or whatever. Yeah. There was one other problem I will note though, because this was a mythological thing. Sean, I'm going to ask you a question to see what your answer is. What happens when someone looks into the eyes of a basilisk? They turn to stone. That is wrong. They die. This is another problem I have with Professor Noggin. Is it's mythology, but it's all the mythologies, and each question kind of randomly seems to choose which mythology it's answering well, to. Technically, if you've turned into stone, you are dead. So I okay, all right. I, mean, I, I guess that would be I, an argument. Yeah, I, I would definitely. I, I don't. As a teacher, I would probably uh, accept either answer, seeing as how both end in the same result. But yeah, there's cards like that, right? Because it's mythology. Now, I'm assuming the Civil War one is probably much more accurate on the facts. So up next is surprisingly something worse. Uh, this is Whittle Moo This. This is another trivia game, one for much younger kids, that is really, to me, just a gimmick and a toy with a bit of trivia thrown in. Uh, the trivia here is Riddles. Uh, one player draws a card and starts reading out three clues. So you have one, two, three clues. The other players have very loud, very annoying, battery-draining animal noise buzzers in the sound of various farmyard animals. These things are loud enough that if you play in my basement, you can hear them from my bedroom. When the reader is reading off the card, the other players think they know the answer. They buzz in. Then they say the answer. If they got it right, they get the card. If they didn't... The you keep reading the card, and the other players get the buzz in, just like every trivia TV show buzz in thing ever. Um, it's loud, it's annoying, and the clues are so simple. Then, talking of going back to last week, talking about brain uh, bad rule books, some of these cards say barn teaser, and I guess there's some special rule that I just couldn't figure out. It's in the rule book, and it was something about you take the three clues, you change one of the clues to come up with a different answer, and if the person guesses your new answer, you get an extra card drawn from the back of the deck. So I'm like, I don't know. If they're suddenly expecting kids to make up their own clues because the, the other answer wasn't on there, I don't know. Like, I honestly couldn't figure it out. So we just skipped that part of the game. Now, this is a game for little kids, way younger than mine, I think, because, like, the clues are 
it's yellow, it's in the sky, and it only comes out during the day, right? Like, it's pretty simple. And that's one of the blue harder ones. Um, plus, if you're like me, the first time one of the kids hits a buzzer, you want to throw those out the window. So th this one is, except for the fact I saved it just to put in the back there for our podcast, and our live show is going right into the donation pile. That one's going away. So interestingly, now they can't all be winners. Um, and so apparently this game is for five and up. Uh, but most interestingly, this was actually released in a minor version by Chick-fil-A as, oh, like, as like a Happy Meal sort of addition. <laughs> so you could get Riddle Moo this. In wow. your uh, in your Chick Fil A and Chick Fil A mini or uh, kids meals, wow! Uh, it uh, has it has one rating of seven point oh on Board Game Geek, uh, and then someone else commented that they had the Chick Fil A mini version, which is wow. why I got I got to googling. I gotta say, if you Google this one, the company that makes this game sends this game to bloggers, and bloggers like to say good things about this. Like, I can't wait to use this in my classroom. Right. There is not a negative review out there of this game. Do not believe some of these reviewers, because oh my god, they, they this is the be all end all game. My kids are gonna have so much fun with the moo buzzers. They're not moo buzzers. You never even hit them all because only one's a moo, another one's a rooster, another one's a cow, or then there's a horse or something. But anyway, yeah, uh, no. Skip that one if you yeah. can. Seven. We seven didn't buy this. That was the, a gift. Uh, seven bucks for the Chick Fil A version on uh, eBay. <laughs> I got to admit, Chick Fil A. If I got if that's got to be a kind of neat Happy Meal toy. I got to say, if it was a Happy Meal toy, I'd probably uh, thumbs up that one a bit more. Right. So on to something actually good. Uh, that is Battle Sheep. I uh, this one's from Blue Orange Games. I bought this years ago. Uh, we tried a couple times to play with the kids, and the kids just didn't get the strategy of the game. Now, it has really cool components. Like, it's it's kind of like Battle Line and that, or um, Splendor. It's got these, like, poker-style chip sheep that have weight in them. Now, they're not poker chips. They're more plastic. Excuse me. They're more plasticky, but they're nice, solid weight to them. And they got these hex maps, and the kids like to make maps, and they try to make pictures out of the maps, and they like playing with the chips, and they like flicking them because they slide really good because they're plastic. But playing the game was pretty much out the window. Now, it's been a couple years, so I asked them, I said, look, you guys, like, you play with Battleship, but you don't play Battleship. Do you want to give it one more shot? We'll play with the real rules, and then you decide we either keep Battleship or we make room for your new games. So uh, we sat down, I retaught the game. So in Battleship, players create a hex-based pasture, uh, which is going to have some gaps on it, just because of the way the boards are designed. And there's going to be gaps and holes. And then they take their stack of sheep, there's 16 of them, and they pick one hex on the edge of the board. Then in turn, you have to split your herd and then move on to greener pastures. So what you do is you take part of your stack, and it has to go in a straight line down a hex row as far as it can until it either hits the edge of the board or another stack of sheep. And you just keep doing this. You just keep splitting your stacks until you can't move anymore. Then it's whoever has the most hexes covered up or the most stacks of sheep wins the game. This is actually a really good area control game that really reminds me of a classic fantasy flight game, Hey, That's My Fish. Though this is a little simpler, because in Hey, That's My Fish, the hexes are worth different points and disappear when you move off them. The thing with this game, though, is it's very cutthroat. Like, the... the actual strategy of the game is all about trying to cut off the other players. So that means it's not going to be great for some families. If you want head to head, if your kids are going to fight over the fact that one player is cutting off the other player so they can't move anymore or eliminating from the game, this game is not for you. If that's not a problem, I do strongly recommend this one, but wait until the kids are a bit older. I bought it when my kids were five and seven and that was too young, but now at eight and 11, they're loving it. Uh. So interestingly, uh, not every family is going to be able to handle competitive head-to-head, -head, uh, or every family yeah. member even. Uh, my daughter loves going head-to-head -head with me on games. She, she's the one who, who grabs the battleship. She grabs the chess. She wants to compete with dad. Mm -hmm. Whereas my son uh, really enjoys uh, playing with. So he's the one who wants the competitive and, uh, and wants to go along with. Um, and apparently, uh, it's actually a redo of a game called Split, uh, Splits. Okay. Um, 
Uh, but Which yeah, makes sense, because that's what you're doing, is yeah. splitting this pile of sheep every time. Uh, and yeah, it, uh, tw- it's odd. It, it's listed as a 2010 game, but 2014 and 2015 was where it cleaned up in its in Best Family Game um, awards. So, also won a bunch of awards. That's good to yeah, hear, actually, because yeah, it, it's worth it. Yeah, best and this family, is one of the best family game at several different shows, and it got its uh, Spiel des Jaux recommended. Yeah, yeah, it's one. The other thing too is this one's good for adults. Like, don't this is definitely not a kids only game. I could oh, bring no. this down to the the local game store, and Sean and I could play it, or we could get a group of four of us playing this yeah, and this have is, a good game. Like, this has got a six a seven game. a six seven with like four thousand recommendations yeah. on uh, on BGG. No, it's solid. Really good. So overall, great day playing with the kids. Uh, we're obviously going to keep Battle Sheep and Quirkle. Uh, Little G has uh, asked to keep Professor Noggin because she hasn't learned everything yet. So I guess it did what it was supposed to do. It got her hooked on learning these cards. Uh, Riddle move this. Go on as quick as I can. Um, if I could reach it right now, I'd probably toss it in the garbage. Uh, that's got to get out of the house before the kids see it again and go, oh, wait, we could use the buzzers for it. No, please. Just overall, though, I got to say, kids' games, man, they are so hit and miss. Like, it is so hard to find good kids' games. Like, like that Riddle Move This, really, like, just, like, a little bit more development. It could have been a game or an editor that read the rule book that explained the barnyard thing. Or the Professor Noggin, why throw in, like, who had the bright idea to go, let's let the kids steal cards from other kids so the dumb kid can at least have a card in front of them? Like, what is that trying to compensate for? Yeah, you know what? It's... And the other problem is kids' minds change, you know, I, and really getting things out of the house swiftly uh, yes. before before something, some wave of fond memories tricks them into thinking that it was a great game and they love it uh, really often is the key. Um, you know, getting them out there before they have the chance to say, but I love that one. Yeah. Because given the <laughs> chance, they will, because yeah. they'll have some memory in their head connected to it that's positive. Um, and you can't deny that. I mean, they really do think that they like that game, even if the next time you get it to the table, they'll hate it again or or, or force themselves to like it just to prove you wrong. <laughs> uh, uh, and for me, uh, the next one I played was Ascension. Uh, so much Ascension. Lots and lots of Ascension. That's one of the things about playing on Steam is uh, if you get some time, you can really just kind of go at it. I've played playing both online and offline. Um now, I'm playing with the full set of available Steam uh, expansions now. I know, I notice uh, I, I haven't gotten anything with dice, so I don't know. So maybe the latest expansion isn't on Steam Yeah, maybe, maybe the latest physical expansions aren't there. Uh, but with about 1,200 cards, wow. uh, <laughs> there's lots to deal with. Uh, and my, prob- my struggle right now is the late game, uh, is some of the really late game stuff. Uh, you and I were talking one day. When I had been in the lead, I'd been feeling really confident about how I was doing. And then in the last two turns, uh, my opponent tripled my score. Wow. <laughs> so I, I need to I need to work a little bit on my late game. I on my in my offline play, I've gotten a little better. So I haven't I'm working on the offline strategies before I go back online and get horribly embarrassed again. Ascension's interesting just because by putting everything together, that's not actually how it was designed to be played. So the way the game came out is it came in in, in sets. So a set would come out, and then one expansion would come out in that set. And those together play awesome. And then the next set would come out, and it's almost a standalone. Well, it is a standalone game. Or you can combine it. But then it would come out with an expansion. Again, those two together would play really well together. And then what happens, we found, when you combine too many sets is some of the unique rules that are in those individual sets just become nothing. So one of the examples, and I don't know if they put them back, but there was two sets that came out with events. And they would just randomly come up and change the rules for one of the, I don't remember how many factions there are, say five factions, whatever the colors. One of the five colors would suddenly change how it plays. But then if you added even one more set to that, like the base rules, the events just didn't come up enough to matter. And that's what I found is so hard to play Ascension with that many cards and that many sets. Like I haven't even tried the last probably three expansions, but even with like four of them, I'm just like, man, I try to get my engine going to rely on this certain trick and well that just doesn't work because yeah the other cards aren't there the event the event thing is a real problem because every once in a while an event will pop up and it can yeah. really change the game yeah but you cannot count on it and no. you know you'll you'll grab that there's that one card you can defeat and hold in your hand and use during mm-hmm. events and so you'll you'll beat that early you'll 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 take one early in the game to have it on hand and then you never and get an event no for the events. entire 
game yeah. and, and it's it's a waste. So yeah, no, yeah. I totally get where that's coming from. So up next for me was my big Saturday night game, which was an epic game of Zaya Legends of a Drift System. Now, I want to spend a little more time on this one because in 2018, I backed their Kickstarter. So this was actually the third Kickstarter they have done. And it's the third printing of the game because the game is popular enough to keep selling out. And they're not in distribution. They don't have a publisher. They, they are a standalone company, far off games. They do everything themselves. And they fund it all through Kickstarter, which is kind of cool that that's a valid way to run a business this year, nowadays. So what they did is they had the Kickstarter this time was for the third printing of the base game, the second printing of the first expansion, which was their last Kickstarter, uh, a remaking of the uh, Cell Sword expansion, and then a brand new expansion called Missions and Powers that was never available before, and some new metal coins. And I backed almost all in. The only thing I didn't do was um, the base game because I already had it. So I had a group over Saturday night to play it. Now, this is a long game, takes up a ton of room, and it's the kind of game where you want to set up ahead of time. You want to set up an event, right? Like, you want to get a hold of your friends and have buy-in. So this was one of those, you know, I went on Facebook, I went in my group, and I said, hey, I want to see if people are interested in playing. So I got people over, I got four people to play, including myself, three other people to play, so we had a four-player game, and we played with everything. I tossed in everything from the Kickstarter. We played with all the stuff. We did went all in, all in for everything. Well, that was a a nice looking box of stuff. You can uh, you can actually check out this whole box as it got gets unpacked up on YouTube. That went live on Monday, um, so uh, you can see what all they played with. Yeah, that was uh, we did. I did an unboxing downstairs because I didn't think I'd have room up here to do it of everything that came from my Kickstarter. And again, it's it, it was all in. It was everything you could get, every add on except the base game. Now, for those of you who don't know Zaya, this is a big sci-fi sandbox. And I know sandbox is usually a term people use in the role-playing when it's you can just get dumped somewhere and do what you want. Well, that's what this is in board game form. You're a pilot with a level one ship and 4,000 credits to your name. Do what you want with it. Sector boards are placed around a central star. You pick a spawn point and go. You want to be the first person to hit a certain fame, say X fame, which is determined by the players, which is five fame for a short game, which take you an hour or so up to 20 for an all night epic space romp. We played at 15. Now getting fame, there are so many ways to get fame. There's actually a card called how to win at the top of the game that I have to remind people to keep looking at so they don't just get distracted doing anything. So it tells you all the ways to get fame. So one of them is exploring the galaxy. Another is delivering goods, but to deliver the goods, you've got to find the goods either through mining or trading. You could be a pirate and take out the other players. There's even NPCs that fly around and do stuff in the game. There's a, a pirate and there's a cop and then there's a merchant that just goes between the planets and keeps getting worth more and more money as he delivers stuff. You could be a pirate and just go blow those guys up. Um, once someone becomes a pirate, they get a bounty on their head. And one of the NPCs starts with a bounty on their head. So you can be a bounty hunter and go hunt down wanted ships. Uh, you can just make lots of money and buy fame because I guess it's very realistic that way. Um, you get fame by upgrading your ship, by completing missions, by completing titles, uh, and probably three other ways I'm forgetting, or four or five other ways. What's great about this game is the openness of it. The fact that literally it's, here's your ship, there you are, what do you want to do? That is awesome. But, man, this is a highly random game. This is, like, almost ridiculously random game. Like, this is, this is a Mera Thrash to, to the max. There, there, this is, there's no Euro game here. Uh, where you respawn is random. If you mine something, it's random whether your ship blows up or you mine something. Completing missions, use D20s to figure out if you complete them properly. Using ship abilities is even random. And how far you move is even random. Yes, this is a modern game in 2019 that is a roll and move game. They still exist. They're still out there. The thing with it, though, is you have to accept that. You need buy-in. If you're playing Zaya, you're not playing to win. Like, yeah, you want to win, but like, you're not going to come in with this huge plan and then execute the plan. No, you're going to explore. You're going to try things. It's all about the experience, and I love it. 
You know, it's interesting with the randomness, this actually sounds more like a computer or a mobile game than a board mm-hmm. game. Uh, and, and as I was reading your description earlier today, going through the show notes, um, I actually pulled up my phone because there was a game called Star Traders RPG, which yeah. I used to play on my phone. And it is remarkably similar, although mm. it's actually, I think, less random. Mm. Um, <laughs> no, it's neat. You know what? It, I almost say it's almost a roguelike because right. everything's generated randomly as you're playing. Like the sectors come out random, and right. if you mine is random. How the NPCs move is not random, but they have a set AI they always follow. Right. It, it's neat. So some notes on the actual new content that we played with. So this is the new stuff. The first thing is the big box. This is Embers of a Forsaken Star. This should be back in print now. You should be able to go get it. That was the whole point of this Kickstarter was to get this back in print. Kickstarter backers have their copies, but you should be able to find it in stores again or order it from far off games. Now, there is a ton of stuff in this box. Like This is a heavy box. This is like up to Agricola weight, even though it's smaller. And what it does that I love is it just takes what's in Zaya and either adds to it or improves on what's already there. So you got new ships, new missions, new titles, a new fame track, some more metal money, and that's all stuff that's just identical. It's just more of the same. Just throw it in the base box. It's now more options. Now there's some new sectors, uh, which you can just toss in, but they do do some neat new stuff. So now there's gravity wells, and there's tiles where there's comets that actually orbit around them as the game goes on. Uh, One of the biggest things that's a new addition, though, is a new market board. Now, this adds supply and demand to the game, something that was much needed in the original. One of the problems with the original was that if, due to the random draw of sector tiles, you ended up with a planet that wanted a good, right next to a planet that needed a good, that was a quick, easy route to victory points. And whatever player figured that out and started doing that first would easily win the game. Now, you could gang up on that player and try to blow them up and all be pirates, but it kind of it scripted the rest of the game. It was, you're either that player winning or you're trying to stop that player from winning. Now, that's no longer the case because supply can run out. Once you do that run a couple times, there's not going to be goods left, so you're not going to be able to do it anymore. Now, there's also a new NPC space station. There are dead worlds that you can search for relics, and then you can bring the relics to the space station to get them clean to find out what they are. Um, They completely replaced all the exploration tokens to not only make exploration a little less random, but more balanced, so that exploration is now a valid way to try to win the game. And there's, again, probably three or four other things I'm totally forgetting about right now. But I gotta say, everything we used from Embers of Forsaken Star was great. It all just made Zaya better or added something new and awesome to Zaya. Like, to me, this is a must-have. If you have Zaya and don't have Embers, fix that now. Uh, it should be back in print soon. It should be out to stores. Go get it. Ask your friendly local game store to get it in. Uh, maybe go to Far Off Games. Yeah, you might want to ask and, and before you start rushing out there to buy it uh current amazon prices are over 300 dollars, so i that's obviously somebody's uh, that's the last printing the last printing yeah. uh that, that's still out there uh but you know what it's really great to see an expansion that sort of not only adds on so much but fixes a lot of those niggling little problems yeah. that, were, that weren't game breaking but yeah. could detract from a great game and so this does that and so much more Um, And it sounds like there's just no reason not to pick it up when it's a reasonable price. Yeah, don't pick it up now. Wait wait a couple weeks. It really shouldn't take long. Like, they did print it. I have my copy. I know it exists. So the next expansion we used was the Sellsword expansion. Now, this was a little box with a ship in it and some cards, and that's about it. This was a Kickstarter exclusive that was created when they did the second printing of the game uh, that they brought back for the next Kickstarter. Now, what's neat about this is it's just one ship, and it's uh, that's something I had mentioned before. Everything in Zaya is pre-painted, comes that way. So it comes with a ton of ship models, and they're all painted, and they're painted well, which is awesome. So this is one more ship and the rules to use it. Now, the neat part is there's two ways to use it. You can just add the ship plans to the game. It's a level two ship that seems pretty solid, comes with 2d6 blasters that are always on the ship that don't take up a lot of room. Cool. Uh, The other option, though, and that's the one that got me to back this, is that it said it could be used as a new NPC. So I didn't really get into the NPC details, but the original game comes with three NPCs, and they're controlled by players who are playing the game, which is great when you're playing three players, because every player controls their own ship and an NPC. Once you throw a fourth player in there, though, 
they're left out, right? They don't have an NPC to play, which is kind of lame. And you can play five player, and then there's two players left out. So I thought, hey, a fourth NPC means next time I play four players, which is my usual group size, they'll get to control. Each player will have their own NPC. That's awesome. Sadly, though, with this expansion, you get a fourth NPC, but it doesn't get given to a player. And that's how this one works, because, well, it's a sellsword, right? Sellsword is a mercenary that any player can hire. And whoever hires the cell sword gets to control them. So that means one player could end up with two NPCs. So every time it gets to their turn, they're taking three turns. So they go, then their one NPC goes, and then they use the cell sword. I don't know. Plus, the NPC itself, they seemed a bit overpowered. Because what the spell cell sword is is a pretty tough ship that you can basically go and attack the other players and the NPCs without having any penalties for doing it yourself because the cell sword's doing it. So there's no risk of your wanted rating going up or anything. Now, I, I guess it might be balanced by the fact that in the rules, someone else can just go pay off the cell sword. So if he's coming for you, you just have to pay him more and then you can use him to go back and get the person that hired him. I don't know. I, overall, it's it's okay. It just it didn't do what I wanted to do. I wanted a fourth NPC for that player to control, and I really don't like the fact that the person who's hired it, if they already have an NPC, is basically getting three turns in a row. So I don't know. It's it's not a bad add-on. I still haven't used it as a new ship, but I think that's my plan next time. Is next time I play, I'm just going to say, hey, there's a new level two ship you can buy the cell sword ship. That makes sense. Yeah, and and BGG does say come out outright and say this is a three player game this is best as a three player game yeah. uh, and i'm sure it's for the very reasons you just listed that uh, you know if if you're if you're below that or above that mm. the see count just doesn't work um, exactly so which actually cell sword was probably their chance to change that to a 4 yeah and it, best they, they four obviously and they didn't. missed their chance i'm i'm sure there are variant rules out there if you want to oh i'm sure <laughs> there there always are so up next is the missions and planets. This is the new thing for 2018, 2019. Uh, this is something that, that people who've owned Zaya since the beginning have not had it access to. Uh, what I don't know, actually, is if this is a Kickstarter exclusive or if this is going to be available in stores. I'm not sure on that. So what this is is a deck of cards for the game that's split in two parts. First are new missions. Uh, there are four new mission types, two legal and two illegal missions. These are simple enough. Take them, drop them into the base game, shuffle them in, good to go. One of the neat things, though, they've done is every mission in the base game is keyed to a very specific sector tile. And if that sector tile doesn't come up through exploration, you're kind of stuck. You're like, well, I can't do this mission. Now, when you get missions, you get to pick one of three and put the other two in the deck. So it's, it's not like your game's stuck. Well, what they did with these, instead, they keyed them to sector types. So... Uh, neutral worlds or ice asteroids or gravity wells. So there's much more chance the missions you draw are viable and can be completed. So that's a cool bonus. I like that. Uh, that's a nice touch. Now, the other half of the deck, though, is what I really like from this expansion. And those are replacement ship cards for every single ship in the game, except that Kickstarter exclusive Cell Sword, which is, I'm kind of surprised they didn't toss it in there. But then if they did, anyone who didn't have the Cell Sword would be like, what's this card? So whatever. So that's cool because when you buy a ship, you get a card and that ship has a special ability. Well, now when you buy a ship, you have a choice of does it get this or that? So you're really doubling the amount of options in the game every time you're getting a new ship, which is pretty cool. Now, neither of these I see as a must have. Like this isn't like embers. It's not fixing the game in any way, but they're both cool additions to the game. I'm, I'm a fan of it. Now, the last one was a complete real waste. Uh, it's the metal coins. I, I think it was a $10 add-on item to get shiny, nice, shiny, copper-colored metal coins with their own unique back that say 2,000 credits on them. Uh, there's no reason in the game to not just use 1,000 credits until you get up to five, but I kind of like having the twos because they're shiny, and I'm a bit of a completionist. But I got to say, really superfluous. You don't need these coins. Yeah, it's uh, it's interesting. Just in case Mo hasn't sold this to you well enough, <laughs> uh, this is a seven point eight yeah, on BGG with five thousand ratings. Mm -hmm. And just scanning through, these aren't all positive ratings. I mean, no. the Euro, the hardcore Euro people hate this game. Oh yeah, <laughs> uh, because of the randomness. Uh, so if you are a hardcore Euro lover, just move along. There's other games for mm -hmm. you. That's great. Uh, but the people who don't mind a little bit of luck in their game and enjoy the sandbox concept with a sci-fi theme, 
seem to pretty much universally love this game. Yeah. No, I'm right there. Uh, the, with the expansions, I have the base game, love it. Expansion just made it better. Uh, Embers, seriously, we both said it now, must have. Like, get get the get this Embers expansion if you own Zaya. No reason not to. It, it not only adds to the game, it improves it. Uh, Cell Sword, who cares? Like, don't don't no fear of missing out if you didn't get that on Kickstarter. It's not what I expected. It's okay. Uh, the money, yeah, complete waste of my money to get metal money. But you know what? It's cool. I like it. It's it's more metal money. I have a thing for metal money. Uh, missions and powers, welcome addition. I grab them if if they're not a Kickstarter exclusive, pick them up. There's no reason not to. I don't think they do add to the game. Embers is the must have though. Out of these expansions, get that. Like I, I dig this game. Like we played the 15 points. I think we played for 4.5 hours. It didn't even feel like it. We literally sat down because it's hard to judge in this time. Said we're gonna play to 15 points or midnight, whatever comes first. When midnight hit, I'm like, all right, it's midnight. Do we want to keep playing? Yeah, yeah, let's keep playing. <laughs> even though a guy had to go to a game or had to work at 8 a.m. So we we had a great time. I like I did terrible, like really terrible, mostly due to bad rolls. And I, I my ship blew up at least once. Um, but the fact I still enjoyed it. It's just a sign of how good Zaya is. Just know what you're getting when you dive in. Like it, it's not a Euro. It, this this is all about experience. This is an experience game. You're gonna have an adventure. Uh, it's not a heavy strategy tactics game. Get in your shiny new ship. Get out there. Have some fun. Yep. And so uh, my last game of the week was as I mentioned, you know, Star Wars Battleship with my daughter. Hey. Um, it's uh, it's an interesting retheme. I think. I mean, it's Battleship. It's they're all the same. The only difference yeah. is uh, this has little stands where you actually mount ships on the uh, on the pegs, so that you've got a little ship flying above the exact same basically <laughs> ship that goes. All right. uh, the one thing I find I've actually stopped using the ships my, themselves because they're on a little wobbly um, stand. It's not a fixed stand. It's a it's it tilts, and huh. so the ships just kind of fall and flop and get in the way, and you can't get your <laughs> pegs into the board. Um, so I just stopped putting them on. They're cute and they're neat, Odd. but uh, yeah, it's um, if I mean if you can find it cheap, it's 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 fine. But uh, I actually wish, uh, and it's a single board model. The one version of Battleship I've never had is the separate model, so you can actually like sit somewhere comfortably and not have to worry about accidentally peeking over the board. Because um, right. that's that's probably the biggest and hardest part about Battleship I find these days is when you've got the single board model not accidentally looking at what's happening over mm -hmm. on your player's board uh, can be a real challenge. So yet another license game that gets an awesome license, but doesn't actually change the game to reflect no, the license not even, at all. Not even slightly bit. They just added models on top of the boats. Basically. That's so lame. Like, like just sitting right here, I can think of an awesome thing about a star. Like in my head, I'm thinking star Wars battleship. Would it be awesome is if the Imperials entire army are just one square ships. And then the Rebels have, like, big cruisers and stuff. Like, that would totally change Battleship. Like, it, it would be asymmetric, and that would be awesome. Yeah. Like, I would find that fun. It'd be, like, hunt down all the little ties. They could be anywhere. It's so hard. But, like, the Rebel cruisers could fire two shots at a time or something. Like, it's so easy to throw a Star Wars theme on there. <laughs> like, that just drives me nuts. Like, like they could have. Like, why, why wouldn't they? Yep. Now, there is a very out of print, probably $300 version of Battleship that's actually good called Battleship Galaxies. I'd have to look for it. I have it downstairs where they basically tried to make Starfleet battles into Battleship. Okay. Where you actually have a big hex map and your ships are different sized hexes and you use program cards to figure out how they move. And the actual grid is actually where you hit on each individual ship to see if you hit the engines or not. Right. So they can make a good battleship game, but unfortunately that version didn't sell and the promised expansions never came out and it's okay how it is, but could have been better. Well, I mean, let's be honest. Battleship just makes money no matter what they do. They made a movie. True. And they made one of the worst <laughs> movies of all time and still made money. So, but the alien missiles looked like pegs. I oh, thought that part was God. awesome. It was, oh. Because <laughs> I'm like, wait, I finally saw a tie to the board game. Oh, yeah, that was, they, that was the most forced script. I would love to be the people who made money on that script. Oh, like, just God. Really. It was better than I thought, but I, I did not That's think. not saying and, much, though. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> it, it was surprisingly better than I thought. 
All right. We spent a lot of time talking about games this week. I think some of this is maybe going to get cut for the podcast. So final wrap up of the weekend review Ah, time for our less shame, more game update. So the three Zai expanses are new, but they're so new. They never even ended up on the list or the count. So I, and I've already played them. So that just zeroes out right on off done. Now, Quirkle Cubes was an x miss gift from Little G. It's on the list. So that is one game off the pile of shame this week. The pile of shame. That's right. And now we are down to 71 on the pile of shame now. We record the show live Wednesday nights at 930 Eastern on Twitch, and we encourage people to drop in and take part in our chat room in the lobby. Don't forget, if you're here live, we continue the show after the Double Bell in an off-the-books after show, as well as some special features that might make it onto YouTube. Thanks to our moderator, Angie Games. Tonight, in the chat, we have Brian making it in for a visit again. Awesome. Thank you very much, Brian. And here from the very start has been Tech2674. Poncho72 has dropped in to say hi to us. And a whole lot of bots. So we'll... Uh... A whole lot of bots. Well, except for maybe Slow like Cool. I can bots. never remember if Slow Cool is a bot Slow or not. Slow Cool's been in a lot. It has never actually said anything. Yeah, I have a feeling but Slow Cool is a bot. But I, I, I hesitate to, to double down on that. Uh, and apparently we have an actual new Patreon as well as all the awesome. other ones that went through. Uh, P.S. Uh, Gujion? 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 Has... Uh, has Jumped in on our Patreon at the five dollar well, level. Thank you very much. Wow, five dollars. That is awesome. Thank you very much. much P.S. So uh, Brian was pointing out the, uh, actually as you were talking about the uh, the starships concept or the, the the concept for your Star Wars battleship, Brian was coming up with pretty much the same thing. The same. Uh, well, it just it's evident. It's like yeah. it's it's Star Trek. Like you have to have asymmetric battles. That's the whole point. Is the Empire has tons of ships. Yeah. The um. The, the, the rebels have almost none when the empire loses a ship. So you should be able to re put new ships on the board. That'd be an empire thing. You know, they should, ah, that'd be awesome. Right. You have like your battle cruiser that takes up four spots and every round it's not destroyed. It can put out another tie fighter. And I don't know. You for, thank you for the, uh, the bits there. <clears throat> I said, Star Trek. Did I? Oh God. I'm, I'm, uh, the, the, Star wrath, Trek. Oh, oh. the wrath of uh, the internet will come down upon us. I'm wow. Sure. If we put this on YouTube, we're in trouble. <laughs> But thank you for the bits there. Uh, oh, Mo said it. Oh, it's not me. Woohoo! Oh, I said it. Uh -oh. Uh, thank you for the bits there, Brian. Always appreciated. Um, and is, uh, there, I, is there a Star Trek battleship? I don't think I've seen Star Trek licensed. No, I, I don't think I have either. Um, not battleship. I've seen Star Trek games. Oh, yeah, plenty. Um, Brian well, we was pointing spent, out we earlier spent that, that over that, an uh, hour on uh, we can review. That's. <laughs> Brian Oops. was pointing out earlier that uh, those Professor Noggins games are fine if you just want to answer, you know, posing questions to the family, but uh, not an actual game. Yeah, that's uh, it's. I, I guess it's slightly better than flashcards. Yeah. All right, moving on because we spent way too long talking about the week in <laughs> review. I realize some of that were double takes, so maybe it's yeah. not as bad as it seems. As long as it's like forty-five minutes and under, and this next part's forty-five minutes, we're all good. We'll see. <laughs> We are growing through the support of fans like you. So if you haven't yet, please take a minute to subscribe, like, rate, review, click on the bell, thumbs up, or share to your friends. Wherever and however you find us, you can help us grow. Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll send out an email. It's going to recap everything we've released in the week previous. Uh, that's blog posts, content, content, new content. Sorry, I'm, I'm still, Lord of the Rings Battleship is still running through my head and I can't help, but I, I'm going to have to read the newsletter part a bit because I got broken by the Lord of the Rings. G4, it's a Smeagol. I don't know. Wow. <laughs> this is why, see, I had the chat open because we were yeah. looking at the chat. I got to close the yeah, chat close or the else chat this happened. Close your chat when we're not in that section. Yeah, when we're not in that section, Mo is not allowed to read the chat as we get off topic. See, this is good streaming. People should be watching us this week. It's not going to be good for Sean having to edit for the podcast. <laughs> it's going to be good content for our Patreon subscribers when they get their outtakes. Absolutely. Big, big, heavy <laughs> outtakes this week. Big, heavy outtakes. <laughs> Sign up to receive tabletop bill. Blah, blah. Take three. <laughs> I don't care. I'm having fun this week, so I, I don't even. We read the stuff good, except that last line. 
Sign up to receive Tabletop Bellhop Weekly in your inbox. Once a week, I'll be sending out an email recapping all the content we released in the week previous. Blog posts, new podcast episodes, videos, reviews, and anything else we put out there. You can sign up at newsletter.tabletopbellhop.com or go over to tabletopbellhop.com webpage and you'll find a spot to subscribe in the sidebar. We are getting so close to Breakout Con. March 15th to 17th, all three of us are going to be there. Uh, Deanna just booked our tickets yesterday, and I got the email, and I actually let a little woot when I got my little VIA notification. Uh, we're going up Thursday, so we're going to be in Toronto on Thursday around lunchtime, and we're heading home 7 p.m. Sunday. This is such a great-looking event with RPGs, LARPs, miniatures, a fantastic board game room with a huge game library, along with a huge list of panel discussions covering all manner of topics. And they've now added a sealed deck Keyforge tournament with a separate entry fee. Ooh, I didn't see that yet. I knew they, they, they gave me the, the tip that one was coming, but they told me shh, but they didn't give me the details. I'm going to yep. have to look up when that is. Came out on t uh, It is on Sunday morning, a uh, 10 till... 10 till noon, perhaps, for $15. Ooh, if it's only two bucks, uh, 15 bucks is set cost of a deck, so that's nothing. Yep. Sealed deck? Oh, we might have to do that. Yep. Anyway, besides Sunday morning now, I've got a lot of gaps in my schedule for meeting people and networking, and I'm looking forward to meeting up with a bunch of other podcasters, um, industry professionals, and people I love gaming with. But if you want to hook up during that, give me a shout on social media. We'll try to work something out. Go grab a drink, grab some food, or just sit and play a game. Right. We are still looking for advertisers. I am I'm in talks with a couple people, but hey, designers, publishers, writers, artists, creators, creatives, writists, we're looking to promote your thing. We're looking to do 30-second mid-show segments for the podcast in all its forms, live, YouTube, and audio. We're also looking for sidebar ads for the website. Yeah, if you're at all interested, uh, fire off an email, mo at tabletopbellhop.com, or private message me wherever whatever social media you will find me on i'm there send me a dm whatever the the terminology is use messenger i don't know i'll hell i'll install uh what's that chat thing the kids all use i can't remember what it's called so probably not snapchat snapchat there you go you can snapchat me just give me a heads up Most episodes, we look to answer one or more of your game, gaming, or game night questions. You can send your questions to questions at tabletopbellhop.com or head over to tabletopbellhop.com and click on Ask the Bellhop. Uh, social media works too. Uh, we're pretty much everywhere as Tabletop Bellhop one word. I'm not going to say no to a question asked anywhere. Last week, we talked about what to do when you've got a game with a terrible rule book. Yeah, that's right. And... I ended that and our podcast with the final suggestion, and perhaps one of the best ones, was to find someone else to teach you that game. This week, we have a follow-up to that suggestion. Today, we're answering the question, how do you find a tabletop teacher? Now, my first suggestion, uh, by far, if you're lucky enough to have them, is go to your local game store. Hopefully, it's an FLGS and not an LGS, and you have one in your area. Uh, most game stores are going to have game night, some kind of game night where you can just show up and play the games they sell, uh, whether that's demo games they have on hand, if they have their own game library, or if other fans and gamers in the area are bringing games. Now, most are also going to host game nights where they do demos of very specific games, whatever. The, usually it's the new hotness, right? It's going to be game publishers send the game stores these games for them to show off. Now, some stores are even going to be cool enough to open up a game you're curious about and teach it to you. But first, you've got to ask. If you're at the game night, sit down at games and beats hot. Nothing beats experience for figuring out if someone works the way you need for teaching. Very true. Uh, the other thing, while you're at the store, look for a place, uh, like a posting board, right? Some kind of message board. The Most game stores I've been to have these. And you're going to find stuff like, I'm looking for gamers, I'm looking for players. Uh, these are great ways to meet other local gamers, and that includes game teachers. Now, the other trick, and the important part to take that next step, is if you don't see a posting, create one. Go home. 
build up notepad, grab a sheet of paper and a pen, whatever. It doesn't have to look pretty. Note that, hey, I want to play this game. Does anyone local have it? I really want to play it. I don't know how to play it. Can you teach me? Whatever you want to write on it. Uh, but get get the word out there. And a game store is is it's the it's the modern forum, right? It's where gamers gather. It's where to meet other people that share similar interests with you. Now, one overarching theme we're going to have tonight is that communication is important. Yeah. Now, we understand that some people struggle reaching out to others. Um, there are a lot of uh, introverts out there. But mm -hmm. try to remember that the people you're reaching out to often have those same concerns. And that's actually something you can use to meet and interact with those people is because neither of you want to talk to someone else. So <laughs> start there if you need to. Um, but somehow, you know, whether, whether you bring a friend, bring a, bring a wingman or something to get out there and, uh, and meet other people to game with. Um, it's really getting out there and is, is really the only way. And, and remember the one thing that, that I, I, here I am on a podcast talking to the world, but yeah, I have that whole geek. I, I was a geek. I was an introvert. I'm probably still somewhat an introvert. Just the biggest thing that I remember is that these are my people. These, we have something in common. You're not just meeting strangers. You're meeting other gamers. You're, at the place you're you're there to do the same thing you want to enjoy this wonderful hobby of ours you already have that one connection right you made that first step now it's possible that none of this is happening at your local store i kind of think that sucks and this is where i would personally go to the owners managers ask to talk to someone and ask why not Say, hey, like, you don't have any demo nights. That's kind of strange. I'm interested. If you had one, I'd be here. I'll bring my game group, right? Like, let them know you're interested. And, like, hey, have a noob-friendly game night. Like, yeah, you got your mad Friday Night Magic, and then you got board game night, but everyone's all playing 18xx games, and they're not very friendly, and they don't seem to be looking for new players. You guys ever run any, like, family uh, new player-friendly game nights? Like, let them know. Uh, let them know that you'd be interested in doing demos. Like, hey, do you guys get the, any of the new cool mini or not games in? Because I'd love to try them, right? And if you got a game group that you play with at home, offer to bring them all to the store to learn a game. Like, maybe the store management has never even considered this as something the local community be interested in. And, like, pretty much everything in life, it's not going to hurt to ask. Like, what's the worst that happens is the game store owner is like, oh, no, sorry, we're not interested in doing that. And to be honest, if you are, especially if you have your own game group and you're just going to bring them, you're just bringing your own game group and playing somewhere else. Now, sure, you're going to have to talk to people if they come over and say hi and see what, what's going on. And you may need to, to, to start teaching. But that very start, that, that introduction that, that could be tough is really just you playing with the same people you're already comfortable with somewhere else. Mm -hmm. And so that can be a really great way to start. Now, if you don't have a local game store, what it's becoming more and more likely you might have is a game cafe. These seem to be popping up everywhere. Um, I doubt they were the first, but Snakes and Lattes in Toronto is kind of like the grandfather of more modern board gaming. Now, they launched in 2010, and I know people have tried game cafes before, but Snakes and Lattes did it right. Like, they're considered the gold standard as far as gaming cafes go. They, they are the experts in the field. Now, one of their secrets of their success is they have game experts in the cafe. They call them game gurus. They wear a special uniform. And they are there specifically not just to suggest games for groups to play. So you can walk up to them and go, all I know how to play is this, this, and this. Recommend something. They're also there to teach the games. Now, it's not one guy who knows every game in the store or one girl that happens to know their whole collection. They have game gurus that are set up for different specialties, right? So there'll be someone there that maybe their specialty is party games and there's someone else there and their specialty is heavy games. And they are there basically to make it completely new player friendly and remove all the barriers to entry, right? Because people are intimidated by games and they are, uh, they're, they're here because they want to find a teacher, right? And this gives you both. Here is someone that's not only going to recommend a game that's probably going to be good for you and your group, they're going to teach you how to play. This also means that this is a great place to learn games. Like, probably one of the best, because this person is trained and they're just to teach you. Now, not every gaming cafe is quite as impressive as Snakes and Lattes, often, uh, obviously, 
And not all are going to have someone on hand to teach games they have. But it is worth checking out to see if you do have uh, such a cafe in your area. And so uh, while Snakes and Lattes likes to claim that they are the first, they are in no, no way the so. first by, no. by any number of years. But it's also, a stra- it's also a strange question because you get into, I mean, there have been cafes playing checkers and chess for, mm. you know, probably centuries, if not yes. at the very least decades. Um, this one, again, is going to be very dependent on your, on your region. Uh, if you're in a major metropolitan area, odds are you've got a selection. Um, even Hamilton, which is uh, a decent size, has at least one here in town. Uh, but if you're out in rural Idaho, you may be out of luck. So yeah. your mileage may definitely vary on this one. So I, I do think nowadays they are becoming more common than game stores. So if you don't have the game store, it is worth looking for. Now, this is another one. Obviously, uh, is you're not going to have one where you are necessarily, but that's a game convention. Uh, a dedicated to tabletop gaming game convention. Cons are filled with excited people who are there specifically to show off and get you to buy the latest game for whatever company they represent. Like They are there specifically to get you to excited about their games. They want you to learn their games. They, they want to grab you and sit you down in a chair and teach you right then and now. There are people that are, uh, whether that's hired or volunteered, uh, in the booths are trained to teach the games and show them off. This is one of the perfect places to learn a game because you are being taught by someone passionate about the game with a vested interest in getting you to learn the game as quickly, easily as possible and get you excited about it. Now, one of the problems I've found at cons, though, is the companies are usually only doing demos of the new hotness, right? If you're going to go to the Queen Games booth and you want to play a game that came out in 2009, it's not likely they're going to be doing demos of that game. But it is worth asking. Sometimes they do have other games at the booth, just not on display, and they may have a staff member free to teach the game. Now, bigger cons tend to separate the gaming hall from the exhibit hall. And what I've found at any every time this is true is the games being demoed and showed off in the exhibit hall are very different from what's in the gaming hall. And ov- often at the gaming hall, they'll have a lot more variety. And then in addition to that, there's the scheduled game. So it's always worth looking through the con book to see if the game you want to learn is being offered. And in most cases, like 99% of people running games at cons run them noob friendly. They are willing to teach the game. The only thing I don't suggest is entering into, say, a tournament for a game you've never played before. That might be a bit much. And if you do want to do that, just go up and ask. Say, hey, is this tournament free? Like, Are you going to teach the rules or do you want people who already know ahead of time? Now, the other thing you can do at cons is you can be a spectator and learn a game that way. I have done this a few times. You can either find a an event that's going on where they're doing it, a demo game that's going on at a booth, or even someone's pickup game out in the hallway. Now, I found most groups are really cool with having a spectator. And some of the ones I found will even help you out by like saying, hey, I'm about to do this and this is why, and he's going to do this on his turn and explain the rules. But be polite. Don't actually interrupt the game try not to disrupt the game uh watch for those social cues that you're distracting people like maybe they're just being polite saying you can watch but if like the one player keeps kind of giving you a sidelong glance like you're annoying them maybe it's time to move on plus except no like not every group is going to be cool to have spectators though i have found the majority of gamers are more than willing to share their love of the game they're playing and so uh entry games uh, deanna brings up a good point in the chat room there's there's some problems with con demos in the in the actual demo area, uh, often they will only do a partial demo. They won't teach you the full game. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then the other pro- problem is they want you to like their game. They want you to buy the game, which means they want you to win. So uh, yeah. there are often times where they have been trained to throw the game uh, for you to win. So uh, again, you, you know you can get a feel for stuff, but uh, in the game in the actual uh, trade hall, but. It's not necessarily going to give you the true representation of the game. For the first part, where they don't show the whole game, I've found with those, they at least teach you the game. Now, I agree. Deanna and my and myself would rather play the full game because I want the joy of playing the game. But if my goal is to just learn the game, they usually have done that. 
right. that playing one or two turns or playing through two phases is usually enough to have learned the game where I could walk away and probably play a game on our own. Now, if my goal is to play a full game, which it often is as a con, yes, I find that very frustrating and disappointing. But for the purpose of finding someone to teach you a game, I don't think those short games are necessarily a bad thing for that. Now, throwing the game, that's totally different. I am not a fan of when demo teams throw a game. But that does definitely seem to be a problem. But again, I'm not sure if that impacts learning the game. Right. Uh, and then I guess the other thing would be a lot of games, uh, cons now these days are having uh, board game libraries. Mm -hmm. um, and, and odds are good that if you go to that board game library, find a game you want taught, and just kind of hover around there, wait for someone <laughs> yep. to come by and either join their game or watch their game. That's great. Uh, and a lot of, and uh, I know when we were at uh, um, uh, Queen City Conquest, uh, there was someone who eventually came around to teach us about uh, about some games, that, or at least the ones they knew. Um, so, again, your mileage may vary, but uh, there there are some teachers around there, depending on uh, what how the uh, board game library is set up. And here's another shout out to Breakout Con. Breakout's Con Library, when you take a game out, you can get a stand to put on the thing that says looking for teacher. So in that big gaming area, you can grab a game you've never played before, get a copy of it, go sit down, put up that looking for teacher sign. People who are game teachers who know lots of games will look around and go, hey, oh, hey, I'll teach you that. So that's a nice touch. And again, props to Breakout for doing that. So up next, we've got social media. This nowadays, 2019, is probably the number one way people hook up uh, with other gamers and game teachers nowadays. It's it's the way people communicate now. If you're looking for someone to teach you how to play Arkwright for the first time, jump on Twitter and say, hey, I need someone to teach me how to play Arkwright. Is there anyone around? Or go to on your Facebook wall and be like, hey, can't seem to figure out Arkwright spinning Jenny. I need help. Someone will probably jump in there. Throw a picture of the rule book with a big question mark over top and the words I'm lost on Instagram. Do what you can to get the word out there. I bet you someone's going to reply. Now, besides shouting to the darkness like that, you could just go searching for that tabletop tour tutor. Like, that's part of the reason I set up the Windsor Gaming Resource Group on Facebook was for people looking for other gamers, a way for local Windsor gamers to meet each other and interact with each other and hopefully get together and game. Um, Facebook is filled with groups, like tons of groups and pages dedicated to all forms of hobbies, tabletop gaming being one of them. Like when heading to a new city for a trip or vacation, one of the first things I search for is London gaming on Facebook or Toronto gaming. Well, Toronto is huge, so you find tons. But even going to a small town, and I always find groups. And I'll often look like, hey, we're going to be in Toronto for three days. Are there any local groups getting together to play at a game store? And we'll show up to something like that. Now, of course, other social media sites besides Facebook are similar and have search functions as well. Now, I haven't found any to be quite as good as Facebook, but there are plenty of alternatives out there. Absolutely. And this one, again, is much easier if you do struggle reaching out in person to mm -hmm. people, as it's often just easier to reach out and uh, talk to people and interact with people with that screen in front of you. Yeah, very true. For, for good or bad, unfortunately. But... Unfortunately. <laughs> Uh, up next, another online resource. I guess it could be considered social media. I don't know. It's uh, meetup.com. They somehow have risen to be the cream of the crop for sites for meeting locals to do things. Uh, this is an online resource to find about any type of event in your area. There are probably hundreds of meetups for even small town in the middle of nowhere because it's that popular a site. Uh, it's completely free to join as a user. So that's worth knowing. Uh, you just go in, tell it where you are, give it a how many kilometers or miles you're willing to travel, and then start searching for things. Board games, tabletop, RPG, whatever. You should find some local groups. Now, if you can't find a local group on Meetup, and this goes back to put up your own thing, take that next step. Have the initiative. Start a Meetup yourself. Now, this is free as long as your membership stays small. At some point, you get to a certain number of members in your group and you have to start paying. And I'm sorry I don't have that information. I do know it's changed over the years. I personally used to use Meetup and I stopped because our group got too big for it. Now, personally, I found the Meetup's notifications settings to be rather annoying. I either got a, way more notifications than I ever wanted or I didn't get any at all. Mm. Uh, but if you're willing to work within the system and, and take probably more time than I, than I did <laughs> and, and uh, 
to get it right, uh, there is a lot of content for you in oh, yeah. so many areas. It's really kind of uh, overwhelming. I, I was mm. kind of blown away the first time I, I signed in there. Um, but you do still have to go out there and do things when you, when you get there. So it won't get you out there, but it'll give you a lot of options on places to go. Very true. The other problem I personally have to note with Meetup is it doesn't recognize uh, country boundaries. So when you're in a border city like me, I'm really sick of getting notified about uh, events in Detroit because I'm not driving over the border. That's pretty universal about Windsor. I mean, you get yes. you get restaurant recommendations for Detroit uh -huh. on Google. So yeah, so that's that's not really. It just I just want a country setting. Please meet up. Oh. Then maybe I'd use you more. Same with uh, all everywhere, Swarm Jam and all those coupons. Sites. It's a Windsor. It's, it's a universal Windsor border problem. city. There's, yeah. there's probably a few other border cities, especially out in uh, Vancouver area, that have the same uh, sort of issue. I gotta wonder if Phil's sitting there in Buffalo and going, "Damn you, Niagara!" Oh. <laughs> or whatever city's right on the across the bridge there. I don't even remember what it was. Fort Erie. Fort Erie. There you go. Damn you! It's in Fort Erie. Though I went through Fort Erie, I didn't see much of Fort there's Erie. There's really not much to be. Uh, <laughs> You'd be jealous of in Fort Erie. There you go. I wonder if they have a game cafe. I should Google that. All right. Another online resource, one that, that should be paying us for the amount we mentioned them on the show, that is Board Game Geek. Uh, Board Game Geek is huge. It's massive. The, there is so much stuff on Board Game Geek. There are a ridiculous number of resources, many of which people probably don't even know are there. One of those is local forums. Board Game Geek has a forum area dedicated to pretty much every state, province, and country out there. Um, these are great places to find out about local gaming events and meet other local gamers. I actually check the Ontario Forum at least once a week, if not every day, just to see what's going on. Not necessarily in Windsor, it's all of Ontario, but man, there's a lot of gaming events going on in Ottawa. I get jealous looking at that sometimes. This is a great place to meet local gamers. One I have actually used. There are people who game with me now, Charles, Chris Ball, who I met through the local forums on Board Game Geek. Now, in addition to the localized forums, there's also a guild system. So this is like um, guilds or groups on Facebook, right? Every person on there can set up a group. And it's worth to checking to see if there are local groups who set up guilds on Board Game Geek. Like I made one for the Windsor Gaming Resource, though I got to admit I don't maintain it since Facebook's just a better way to get in touch with people. But look, check for local groups. It's uh, when you go to search, you just hit the there's a little arrow to show what you're searching for. And guilds is one of the options. Now, the other thing you do is Board Game Geek's nuts. Every single page, every single game has its own built-in forum with multiple sections. So if you're looking to learn a specific game, you could always go find that game, go on that forum, and just post, hey, uh, gamer in Windsor looking to learn Arkwright, anyone local have this game, or whatever game it might be. Now, when we've talked about how daunting Board Game yeah. Geek can be, it really does have it all if you're mm -hmm. willing to take the time to, to search through it. And Chameleon Cafe and Lounge exists in Fort Erie. There we go. <laughs> or just outside of Fort now. Erie. Just outside of Fort Erie. It's actually in a smaller town than Fort Erie is, but close uh, enough. See? Gaming cafes are everywhere. Pop, yep. pop, 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 pop. So another option. Let's say you don't. You, you, you don't live in Fort Erie where you have a nice gaming cafe. You live somewhere where there's nothing. Um, there's no local cons. You can't afford to go to local cons. All valid things. Uh, you have the option to play online. Uh, this is has become an extremely popular way to learn role-playing games. Role-playing online is almost becoming more popular than playing at tables overall in the world. Uh, you hear about it every day. Uh, role playing online for not only just your own um, your own games or sorry learning new games but also existing games right it just it's huge like if you want to check out D and D you can find an online D and D game anywhere but you can also find someone running Iron Edda Accelerated online pretty easily or you can check out the Gauntlet Network. You no longer need to have all the players in the same physical place to play a game anymore. Now, this is still true with board games. It's not just RPGs, and it goes for learning new games, too. Now, Sean and I have tried learning board games online uh, with mixed results. Uh, 
our experience with Race for the Galaxy didn't go very well. I personally find that nothing actually beats learning something in person, but if it's not an option, setting up a Skype chat could be a valid way to learn that new game. Now, besides doing some kind of video conference, you could also try to learn on a virtual tabletop, whether that's Tabletop Simulator, Board Game Arena, Yukata, or something else. There are many ways to play games online now. Yeah. A lot of it really depends on that specific game as well as how you learn. Uh, whereas a game with crazy components or uh, you know a real tactile feel to the game, uh, yeah. you may not uh, do as well learning that in on a virtual level. Uh, whereas you know some things, uh, I actually just learned Carcassonne for the first time online. Um, there you go. Not not really difficult at all, you know. It's it's quick and easy placement, and and you know, it's there's just nothing nothing really daunting about it. So it's it's there and and easy to go. Yeah, tabletop simulator in particular, I see a lot of people really praising. I personally have never checked it out. I know it's through Steam. I know you can get a VR version. Um, tabletop simulator is also becoming the big way people are prototyping games now. So if you want to learn about a game that's on Kickstarter, you could probably try the actual game through Tabletop Simulator now and possibly even have the designer show you how to play. I'm hearing a lot of buzz about the VR uh, version of yeah. Tabletop Simulator. Apparently it's it's something special. So if you happen to have that computer and the internet connection that's uh, strong enough for it, mm -hmm. um, it uh, it sounds really impressive. I'm, I'm kind of jealous. Uh, I, I've never, done, yeah. never bothered with the VR thing, but... Uh, it, it does certainly sound like quite the experience. Yeah. And again, it sounds like a great way to learn a game. Heck, in that case, you don't even need the game. Yeah. <laughs> like, you don't even need the physical game in any way. So I'm just going to wrap up with a couple other resources. I don't have nearly as much to say about these, and these aren't necessarily ones I've seen working all the time. But there are things you can check out. Again, these are good if you... Um, don't have like a local game store, right? Or you don't have anything that you can necessarily like that hub to get connected with. So one of them is just go to the publisher's website. Quite a few publishers include a community section on their website. And I found these often have links to where you can find events featuring their games or forums for their games. The forums are even more common. So you go to the dedicated publisher's website and you can go on and say, hey, I have this game. I'm looking for someone local to play. If you're really lucky, they may even have one of those put in your address and find out where you can find our games, which might be able to lead you to someone that could teach you the game. Of course, as we found out last week, some major publishers like uh, <laughs> Cryptozoic use yeah. Board Game Geek as their forums. So if you go to the Cryptozoic website and go into their public forums, all of a sudden you're in Board Game Geek. Yeah, so. that's an interesting way to do it. I remember seeing this with uh, miniature gaming. I, I can't remember the company that did it, but it was one of those, like, which army do you play? You'd put that in and you put where you're located, and they basically had to find a match, right, where you could right. find other local gamers to play. I think, unfortunately, uh, people are getting a little more cautious about throwing information like that yeah. into random search engines. So it's a little harder, especially with uh, with laws like we've got now passed in the, uh, in the, in EU. the, in yeah. the EU to... Uh, spread that sort of information around and store that information. Oh, you know what? What not? See, when I did the research for this article, I swear Privateer Press was where I used to be able to do this. And I looked it up and saw, I'm like, hey, cool, Steve Joannis is running an event at the CG Realm this weekend. That's cool. I tried that, and it's gone. And I wonder if that's what it is. I, I wouldn't be surprised at all if GDPR, regulations. GDPR is probably uh, crushing that sort of thing. I totally, that makes sense. Because I swear it used to be more common. Now, like, you still will find community sections, but the whole find a gamer thing, I did have a harder time finding this time around. Yeah, because the, the, the ability to keep someone's personal information yeah. is uh, so limited by law. Interesting, interesting change. Uh, up next, apps. There are a growing number of apps and I guess also websites dedicated to finding you a gaming group. Um, just after a quick search, I found Game4, Nearby Gamers, Find Gamers. 
Uh, as far as I can tell, these seem to work best when you're in a big city, right? You need to be in a metropolitan area. You need to find not only a local gamer, which may be difficult, but a local gamer who's also installed this app and who's also registered and put their address or whatever in, right? So I don't know. To, to me, I've never had any luck with these, but they may work great for you. Uh, I know part of the problem is, too, is a lot of these apps are U.S. only. So I get them, I download them, and I go to put in my address, and it wants my zip code. And I'm like, uh, no, sorry, I don't have a zip code and the app just doesn't work anymore because they don't realize that not everyone in the world has zip codes uh so eh, you can check them out let, eh, if you find a good one let us know i'd love to know if there is a good matchmaking gamer matchmaking app out there yeah unfortunately um unlike a dating app there just isn't a large enough population to make it work yeah. with a dating app there are people all over everywhere who are looking for a, a match uh, but when you try to find the ones that are actually gamers and narrow it down and narrow it down, the the sheer volume of users just aren't really there uh, to make it as successful outside of major, you know, massive metropolitan areas, uh, and particularly in America, where the developers are, are likely going to be as well. Mm -hmm. Uh, another thing you can check, now this is local, this is something thankfully are still around, and those are local libraries. Um, I admit personally, I haven't done much with the Windsor ones, but from what I see online, game nights at libraries are becoming a thing, like a really popular thing. Actually, there's a really good podcast called the Games and Libraries podcast that talks about bringing games to libraries. This is definitely something that's growing. Uh, as far as I can tell, no one in Windsor is running gaming events at libraries, and sadly, I don't have the time to start it up. But it's definitely worth checking your personal local branch to see if they have anything tabletop related going on. You know, libraries in many communities are finding new and fresh ways to stay relevant. Um, I know here in Hamilton, your library card is a powerful, powerful tool uh, that accesses recording studios, photography studios, online learning, 3D printing. Um, and so the, uh, the chance that uh, if you've got a, a growing library uh, in your area, uh, there's a lot of opportunities for yeah. things. And, and they may be open to starting new things if... Uh, if it isn't there already. All right, my last suggestion. This is a bit tug in cheek. I call it the supermarket pickup. I don't even know if that's something that still exists. It's definitely something that exists when Sean and I were younger. Uh, this is how I used to meet gamers back before the internet. I would go to the local hobby store and I would hang around at Leisure World and I just kind of keep walking up and down until I'd see someone pick up a White Dwarf magazine or look at the back of Talisman. And then I'd kind of move in and be like, oh, do you play board games? Do you play Talisman? Like, oh, I see you're looking at White Dwarf. Do you play Warhammer? Uh, you could do this nowadays. You could still kind of do it. Uh, you know, you hang out in the board game section of your local target or, you know, go to the, the RPG section of your local chapters in Barnes and Noble and wait for someone else to come over and be disappointed that all they sell is D and D. And you can be like, yeah, doesn't it suck? They only sell D and D. Oh, what do you play? Uh, the whole thing with this though, is like, try not to be too creepy, right? Like I'm making the joke that it's the supermarket pickup. Cause you know, back in the day that was considered the meetup place for, for people who couldn't find love. So, uh, perhaps a better idea though, might be to, um, Go to the hobby store and post up a sign like we talked about with the FLGS that you're looking for for local gamers. But just make sure you use a shiny new Hotmail address at the bottom of that one instead of your regular one because you never know who's going to reply. So I, I recommend you don't park in that white cargo van at the end of the street and put yeah. free games on the side. Just don't. There you go. <laughs> uh, <laughs> looking for teacher may, may get the wrong responses as well. Yeah, that's true. Uh, <laughs> watch your wording. Yes, watch your wording. No, seriously, it, it, like I'm joking, but this is kind of a valid thing to do, right? Like that's kind of what one of the great things about game stores being a local forum is it works, right? Like go to the game store, hang out, talk to the owners, flip through some of their new stuff. And then when you see someone pick up a game, you know, be like, oh, have you played that before? Right? Like it, it is a valid way to meet other gamers. Doing it at Target and Barnes and Noble is where it gets a little weird, but hey. And don't be that guy who goes up and goes, don't buy Monopoly, that game's terrible. Don't do that. That's not cool. Well, this was a great talk. If you'd like to read more gaming and game night advice like this, be sure to check out the blog at tabletopbellhop.com and click on Gaming Advice, where you will see this and other questions answered in blog form.
Uh, speaking of questions, please send us your questions. We would love more questions. Uh, you can do that on the website under Ask the Bellhop, or you can email us at questions at tabletopbellhop.com. Now, a quick shout out and a thank you to our Patreon backers. Their support helps make this show possible. Uh, Misdirected Mark joined Phil, Chris, Bob, and now Camden every Tuesday night at 8 p.m. Eastern as they talk games and game mastering. Brian Kurtz, thank you. Good to see you on our new Discord, and good to see you in the ch chat room this week. Graham Barnett, I saw you sent me a question today. I haven't had a chance to read it yet, but I will get to it. Joe Thwick, Swick, thanks, Joe. Jeff Seuss, thank you. William Fisher, thanks. Diane Tuzano, thanks, Ma. Danielle Thomas, thank you very much. And welcome to our latest patron, P.S. Goujon. At least that's how I'm going to pronounce it until someone tells me otherwise. There we go. Going to use uh, the French Canadian I got growing up through that little bit. I do have something new for our patrons. Yesterday, I set up a tabletop bellhop Discord server. Uh, this server is going to be exclusive to patrons at the Great Tipper Better level. Uh, there, you're going to find links to all of our content as it's released, possibly before it's out to the public. Uh, behind the scenes info and both text and audio chat rooms where you can interact with us and other fans. Now, in the future, we plan to do things like uh, live audio chats, AMAs, and things like that in that channel as well. Thought that was the double bell. That means my shift's coming to an end, and we're going to have to lock those front doors. Though the doors to the lobby are closed, you can always find us across the web and social media as Tabletop Bellhop, one word. Drop by our website at tabletopbellhop.com for more gaming content. If you like the content we're providing and would like to help support our continued efforts, please consider tipping the bellhop at patreon.com forward slash tabletop bellhop. Remember to join us here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 9.30 p.m. Eastern and watch for the Tabletop Bellhop live to hit your podcatchers and YouTube at 2 a.m. Eastern every Tuesday. Well, that about wraps up the time we have for the show tonight. For those of you here live, thank you for joining us. Hang around and join us in the penthouse suite for the Off the Books After Show. For Tabletop Bellhop Live, I'm Sean. And I'm Mo. Thank you, and game on.